Hamilton to Alex Bowen next on my right. Alex is a principal research fellow and leads the work on green growth at the LSE here in London. Um, Alex, you've been working um, with ADBI on their low carbon growth strategy. You previously worked on the Stern Review, so this is very much what you do. Green jobs, green growth is the stuff you've been um, researching and writing about. So we'd love to hear your perspective on, on this topic. Great. Well, thanks very much, Sam. Yes, I, I had the uh, good fortune to work with Dean Kawai and his uh, colleagues on the Low Carbon Green Growth in Asia report, which is uh, out shortly. My background is as a macroeconomist and labour economist. I'm not a, an Asia expert. And um, I must say, I did find it really instructive, very stimulating to uh, hear about the uh, experiences in, in Asia in uh, adapting development strategies to uh, increase the, the green component. Um, what struck me, I th think, most forcibly was first uh, the many uh, examples of very good practice uh, that can be found in the region, but second, the heterogeneity of experience. Uh, and that means there's a lot of scope for learning and knowledge transfer with within the region. Um, may I? Use the uh, mouse or the yes. yes. Uh, mm. Thanks very much. So f first of all, I just wanted to um, say a quick word about uh, how I see um, green growth uh, or going green as a development strategy for Asia. Um, as the World Bank has argued, I, I think that uh, one can see this really as putting into practice uh, principles of sustainable development. And it, this may be, uh, in some people's view, putting uh, old wine in new bottles. Um, but I do think that uh, two aspects need to be stressed. And this came out very much from the workshops uh, that the ADBI uh, ran last year. First, green has come to the fore because some environmental problems have really moved up the policy agenda. Most obviously, climate change, but also, in fact, uh, air pollution in, in the big cities of, of Asia. And second, I think, issues to do with uh, land management, particularly forest management in many of the poorer countries in, in Asia. The second point is that growth has come to the fore. Um, uh, it, it's well known that there was hardly any discussion explicit, explicitly about growth in the Brundtland report back in the, in the 80s. But experience since then, uh, I think, has shown that economic growth under certain conditions is a very powerful force to lift people out of uh, poverty. And certainly, I got the sense talking to uh, Asian collaborators, uh, the uh, idea of prosperity without growth uh, has no traction in, in Asia. So I, that, I think, is necessary background to, uh, to the report. But I'd s still argue that the three pillars of sustainable development, the environmental, economic, and social pillars, are uh, still uh, relevant. I wanted to talk very briefly about two uh, aspects of going green, which um, uh, I, I contributed to in, in the ADBI uh, report, and that is innovation and green jobs. Uh, and I think the story is slightly different on these uh, two topics. First, with um, innovation, um, it's a great uh, topic for uh, economists like myself because this is an area where there are loads of market failures uh, and uh, from traditional uh, economic perspective that uh, justifies uh, policy intervention, um, but it also provides a challenge uh, of, of uh, analysing problems properly in order to design the right sorts of uh, interventions. So we have spillovers from knowledge production. We have difficulty on the part of in inventors uh, capturing returns. We've got a danger of uh, uh, actually creating monopoly power through patents and so forth uh, if we try to deal with these market failures in a naive way. So uh, 
I think innovation is an area where policy intervention is crucial, but it's also difficult. It's not difficult because of resource costs. Um, so this isn't an area where one wants to add up percentage points of GDP to say what has to be done, but it is an area where uh, there are all sorts of special interests, uh, there are all sorts of political economy problems, there are all sorts of analytic uh, challenges. But I think this is important in the Asian context because uh, uh, for many of the um, uh, higher income, more successful uh, economies in Asia, uh, the tendency in the past <coughs> has been to rely on uh, capital uh, accumulation and the reallocation of workers from less productive to more productive sectors of the economy. This, these sources of growth are not going to be quite so easy to exploit as Asian economies become richer. Um, in many countries already, <coughs> populations are aging. Uh, it's likely that that will be followed by declines in saving rates. Uh, the movement of people out of rural agriculture into uh, urban industry and services will uh, uh, continue, obviously, but I think will uh, run out of steam uh, at some stage for the richer countries. So development will inevitably entail, at some stage, increasing reliance on knowledge-based growth, including uh, growth based on, on new skills. And... Uh, looking at the evidence uh, from Asia, some countries in a very good position to graduate, if you will, to um, uh, knowledge-based uh, economy. Others will find it uh, more of a challenge. This chart shows on the uh, horizontal axis the proportion of GDP spent on research and development in general in a range of countries, the, the Asian countries picked out in, in green. The vertical axis shows the uh, number of scientists and engineers per million people um, as an indication of the, the human skills uh, uh, available for innovation. And the size of the bubbles indicates the, the absolute level of R&D spending. And I think what's interesting from this is how there's one group of Asian countries, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and especially Japan, uh, that have been seizing the opportunity to benefit from R&D despite the, the many market failures that I mentioned. So they, they have found ways of designing a, a national innovation systems that seem, seem to work, at least uh, from this chart, in uh, generating sufficient inputs. I'll come on to say something about the, the outputs of these innovation systems. But um, for uh, India, for, for China, uh, from this chart, uh, there's scope to, to increase both human capital and R&D spend. That's been happening to a certain extent. This chart shows um, R&D spending relative to uh, GDP amongst a selection of major global economies. And uh, one can see right at the top, um, Japan with uh, Korea having uh, caught up in terms of the proportion spend. Uh, down close to the bottom, but also showing uh, a rapid increase uh, in the past uh, decade or so, is, is China. Uh, and I'll say in passing, it's a little bit of a contrast with uh, the experience in my, my own country, the UK, which is uh, pointing in the wrong direction. Um, what about uh, green innovation? Uh, well, this, this uh, table is taken from work of a colleague of mine at uh, the LSE, which looks at uh, climate-related inventions. Uh, my colleague Antoine de chez le has combed through <coughs> patent applications and classified them according to uh, whether or not they can be regarded as climate-related. And what stands out here is the change. If one looks at a broad uh, period, 1980 to 2007, we, we see a ranking, but if one looks at the latter part of that period, just 2002 to 2007, the ranking's a little bit different. And the key thing here, I think, to draw attention to, uh, well, two, two things. First, Japan's at the top in both. Again, a good uh, um, exemplar of what, what can be done. But second, uh, Korea and China have really 
moved up uh, the rankings. And South Korea here uh, has moved up in the latter part of the period to fourth uh, in, in the world as a whole. Uh, China comes in at seven, having in fact been at 14th uh, if you look at the overall period. So there's really some uh, experience of rapid uh, ramping up of innovation, which I think is very reassuring. What uh, policy implications does the ADBI report draw out? First, the need to strengthen national innovation systems, and examples uh, are provided uh, from Japan, Korea, China, Singapore. Second, um, research, uh, development and deployment needs to be concentrated on adapting innovations in the first instance from leading innovators, including, of course, those from Asia itself. Uh, it needs to exploit uh, local comparative advantages, which for some countries will mean manufacturing. In others, it may have more to do with agriculture and land use. Third, delivering innovations appropriate to the structure and resources of the economy. And that, that it appears, is a real challenge for the poorer countries in, in Asia. Um, time and again in, in the workshops, uh, there was discussion of the problems that the poorer countries in Asia have in developing appropriate technology, adapting cutting-edge technology for local circumstances. There also was, I think, quite a strong consensus uh, that environmental pricing needed to be part of national innovation systems. This was the, the only way that you were going to get a pervasive signal to develop ideas in the right area and actually to deploy them. Um, and there was much discussion, uh, particularly in the margins of the workshops, about how the UNFCCC negotiations might be used to improve knowledge transfer and adapt it appropriately. Let me move now to green jobs briefly. Um, this is another area <coughs> where market failures abound and uh, economists of my ilk jump in saying, right, let's, let's look at how we design appropriate policies. Um, and here I think this, the story is, is more nuanced, and um, I can understand where uh, Stefan Durkon from DFID uh, is, is coming from on this, because clearly green growth is not a, a panacea for labour market um, issues. Uh, putting right the, the market failures of the sort I list here um, can raise employment, boost growth, and... Uh, help develop new green industries. But carbon pricing, which I would suggest is a vital part of green growth strategies, gives rise to problems. More expensive energy, lower real wages, bluntly. So uh, we'll need to weigh these uh, issues uh, in the balance. Now, the experience in the Asian region, I think, is somewhat different from um, the developed countries uh, on which, for instance, the OECD's work on green growth has, has focused. But it's very heterogeneous. This chart's a reminder of the need for additional jobs, which is very, very uh, uh, marked in some countries within Asia, but much less so in others. The, the chart shows projection of the change in working population uh, up to 2025 as a percentage of the 2010 population. The sample of countries is, is taken from the membership of the Asia Business Council. And you can see here um, Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, India, they really do have an issue about gross job creation. They just need a lot more jobs. For Korea and Japan, uh, the story is rather different, indeed for China already because of uh, population policies. And it's there it's more to do with how labour markets work and the quality of jobs and the structural changes needed within uh, the labour market. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, just pass through here. One, one chart I just wanted to show briefly illustrates how much more work needs to be done in the region um, to improve the knowledge base. Uh, this, this chart 
shows the considerable employment potential for wind energy in India. But it shows three estimates from three different research institutes, mm -hmm. which are of considerable variance. We need to know more about actually what the opportunities from green growth are. There's still an awful lot of uh, uncertainty here. Um, given the time, I'll move just to my final slide on green jobs. What are the policy implications which the uh, ADBI report draws out? It's a rather familiar list, and, and I put this up because mm -hmm. green growth isn't a different answer. We need <coughs> active labour market policies, we need investment in skills, public employment programmes need to take account of environmental objectives. We need to take account of the state of the macro economy. So in a lot of discussions at the moment, I think, uh, uh, place undue weight on the current global circumstances and don't look at what will be needed down the road should uh, the global economy uh, grow more rapidly. And all this requires a better understanding of the structure of labour markets, which differ across countries. So on that note, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you very much.